Welcome everyone to my talk today about alternative and novel ligands for future protein degraders. So our group is part of the Department of Protein Evolution and interested especially in molecular recognition and catalysis. However, you don't have to be an evolutionary biologist to appreciate that proteins are essential for virtually all processes outside and inside the human cells. They are essential for growth, signaling, stability, and transport. However, due to aging of proteins, misfolding and mutations, it can become necessary to get rid of these proteins, as many diseases are associated with the dysregulation of proteins. And this is the job of the proteasome. The proteasome is arguably the most important machinery for polypeptide recycling in the human cells. It is part of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, which involves several enzymes that take part in it. First, the E1 enzyme activates an ubiquitin molecule that is then transferred onto an E2 enzyme. This E2 enzyme then comes together with an E3 ligase to an E3 ligase complex. This complex is able to recognize and recruit substrates to the E3 complex, which are then polyubiquitinated and shuttled to the proteasome, where they get degraded into small peptides. There are many of these E3 ligase complexes known in humans. In fact, over 600 have been described so far. Here, they are divided by simple on the left, so single subunit, and complex, so multi-subunit complex E3 ligases on the right, with some of the major classes annotated here. And let me draw your special attention to the right picture of the complex E3 ligases. Because of the multi-subunit E3 ligases, we and others have especially been interested in the two cullen-based E3 ligases, CRL4 cerebron and the VBC, the VHL, elongin B, elongin C complex. And this is because both of them are ubiquitously expressed throughout most tissues in humans. In the following slides, I want to highlight their general function and overall structure using CRL4 cerebron as a, an example. So within the normal cell, this complex consists of a Cal4 domain, the ubiquitin carrying E2 enzyme, and the DDB1 domain, which anchors the substrate receptor cerebron, shown in green here, to this complex. Cerebron, as the name suggests, as the substrate receptor, is able to recognize and recruit endogenous substrates to the complex, which then get polyubiquitinated and subsequently degraded by the proteasome. For cerebron, this recognition of endogenous substrates, like here for example shown for glutamine synthetase, is not well characterized and is something that we are working on. However, this shall not be the focus of this talk today, but instead, so when small molecules referred to as molecular glues or immunomodulatory drugs come into play, this situation changes. This class of molecules started with the development of thalidomide, the cause of the Contagan scandal, and its second and third generation analogs, linalidomide, pomalidomide, avodomide, and ibodomide. All of these molecules, however, are able to bind to cerebron. And by binding, these molecules remodulate the substrate recognition interface of cerebron with their protruding moiety. So this moiety that is solvent exposed. This then leads to the recruitment of non-endogenous or neo substrates. These neosubstrates include therapeutically relevant targets such as CK1-alpha or the transcription factors Icarus and Iolos. Their degradation explains major parts of the efficacy in the treatment of multiple myeloma, for example. However, the same mechanism of action was also suggested for SALF4, whose degradation is likely the cause for limb deformation seen for newborns when using thalidomide during pregnancy. However, a major advancement of this molecular approach of proximity-induced therapeutic degradation is realized in the PROTEC approach. PROTEC stands for proteolysis targeting chimera and fuses a E3 binding moiety and a warhead together via a linker. Now the E3 binding part binds to the E3 ligase, while the warhead captures the target, the protein of interest. This target, in the best case, then gets polyubiquitinated and degraded. 
The newest database on Protex shows that so far over 2,200 Protex have been described, with the Alvinas compound against castration-resistant prostate cancer in phase 2 clinical trials being the most advanced so far. Protex development until now is mostly combinatorial. By using different E3 binders, linkers of different length and chemistry, linking into a warhead against the protein of interest. Key E3 ligases until now are especially VHL and Cerebron because high affinity and specific E3 binders are known, these binders have no reactive groups, and structural information of the binding modes to the E3s are characterized. Especially for Cerebron, Protect design is almost exclusively limited to the classic immunomodulatory drug scaffold, consisting of the glutaramide binding mode and often a phthaloil moiety attached to it. So since you are tuning in today, you probably know this already, but let me highlight why the Protec approach is becoming so popular. Classic small molecule inhibitors usually bind to the active site of a target, in this case a kinase inhibitor to the kinase ddl one this mechanism of action is almost always inhibition by occupancy-driven binding to a functional site. However, only 20% of the proteome can be addressed with this approach, while the other 80% remain undruggable. This is where molecular glues and protex can theoretically address the other 80%, because any binding site can be used to recruit them to the E3 ligases, and the target then is eliminated instead of inhibition. And moreover, only small amounts of protex are needed because they exhibit a catalytic mechanism of action. So the development of molecular glues started out as a uh, serendipitous discovery of thalidomide being able to redirect cerebron to degrade novel targets. And the development of protex, as briefly mentioned, is mostly based on combination of different building blocks. Especially for cerebron, the E3 binding scaffold is almost exclusively limited to glutaramide. So, as a group specialized in biophysical assays and structural biology, our initial goal was to characterize the ligand space of cerebron by using chemical modifications of known binders, but also search for other, possibly chemically distant binders. For this, Several constructs of bacterial and human cerebron were designed and used to assay effectors for their affinity as well as their binding modes. Our motivation as a somewhat small group is to develop new building blocks for both the molecular glue and the protec approach and thereby show alternatives to the classic thalidomide scaffold. So getting a bit more into detail about cerebron, as shown before, cerebron acts as the substrate receptor of CRF4 cerebron E3 ligase complex. It is present in most eukaryotes and ubiquitously expressed in humans. For us, the most important domain is the C-terminal thalidomide binding domain, short TBD, of which orthologs are highly conserved. And so uh, we are also working with the single domain bacteria homolog, referred to as MSCR4. Both of them are structurally highly similar, as you can see on the right side by their superposition. And both of them possess the highly conserved tritryptophan aromatic cage, by which the classic immunomodulatory drugs are able to bind. As mentioned in the last slide, we are mostly interested in the thalidomide binding domain. And so before working with the isolated domain, we characterized our construct and its stability. As you can see here on the left from its nano DSF measurements, the domain itself shows a melting temperature of around 50 degrees Celsius. Furthermore, imid binding, in this case with thalidomide, further stabilized the protein. And so we concluded that we have a pretty good construct to work with at hand. For the bacterial protein, referred to as MSCF4, overall melting temperatures were about 20 degrees higher. We saw that, for example, the purification tag, a his tag in this case, significantly decreased melting temperatures, while ligand binding, as expected, significantly increased the melting temperatures. Additionally, mutations of bacterial residues to mimic human amino acids barely affected their stability, as shown for here these uh, humanized constructs. With these constructs expressed, purified, and characterized, we previously set out to probe the chemical ligand space of cerebron. For affinity measurements, we had established a FRET assay that relies on a custom reporter, shown here in blue, 
This reporter builds a fret pair which is excited at the tryptophan wavelength of 295 nanometer and emits at 440. This fret assay was tailored specifically to bacteria cerebellum. In addition to several interesting findings, we saw that succinimide showed a much higher affinity to cerebellum than clotaramide, in this case 4.3 micromolar instead of 28 micromolar. This is especially interesting if we consider again that the classic immunomodulatory drugs all rely on clotaramide for binding to cerebellum. And so we previously designed several analogs based on both succinimide and glutaramide and assayed them for their binding affinities and determined their binding modes via X-ray crystallography, which you see on this slide here. What we saw was that succinimide and glutaramide both form the same basal interaction with the aromatic cage of cerebellum. The amide linker, which we used to attach protruding moieties to the constructs, form a direct hydrogen bond with the conserved asparagine 50, and since even prolonged compounds like seen for 11A and 12A retained affinity, we concluded that this aminosuccinamide scaffold can serve as a universal cerebellum binding motive. Interestingly, without actually tuning these compounds to do so, several of our designs showed neosubstrate degradation in a cell-based assay. We saw that the neosubstrate iolos, which you see here at Western Blood 4, was degraded especially by our design 7F which, if we look at the crystal structure of the compound and the superposition of the zinc finger iolos in complex with human cerebellum, we find that both of their binding modes are incompatible. This suggests that there are more ways of recruiting zinc fingers to cerebellum than previously characterized. However, as mentioned before, the high affinities of aminoxuximamide and the fact that prolonged compounds retain the affinity led us to the conclusion that um, this aminoxuximamide scaffold can serve as a universal binding mode. During our studies, however, we were not really satisfied with the biophysical assays that we were using, as especially autofluorescence was a major issue for the FRED assay. So we took the structural information of the two most widely investigated E3 substrate receptors. VHL on the left here in complex with hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha derived peptide and on the right thalidomide in complex with cerebellum. So we used both of these ligands and turned them into reporter molecules by linking fluorophores to them. In the case of VHL we attached this 5 fa molecule and for cerebellum we attached this body dye. And these reporters allowed us to develop a competitive MST assay. Most of you probably know what MST is, but as a quick reminder, microscale thermophoresis relies on a fluorescent molecule whose fluorescence is recorded over time. And then upon induction of heat via an IR laser, in this case the molecule displays positive thermophoretic behavior and moves out of the hot zone. Our assay now relies on these custom reporters, which bind to either VHL or cerebellum. The out competition by ligands in question then sets the reporter free into solution. The amazing effect in our case, however, was that for cerebellum, the reporter shows a negative thermophoretic behavior in the bound and positive in the unbound state. And this reversion really leads to very high signal to noise ratios, which then can be used to determine binding affinities with high confidence. We visualize this in this uh, most recent paper here, where we show that in addition to measuring classic immunomodulatory drugs with very high signal-to-noise ratios, we also identify unexpected high affinity binders. And here especially the hepatitis C drug Dazabuvir show very high affinities competitive with the best immunomodulatory drugs that we've measured. This MST assay really allowed us to go uh, back to a high throughput screen that we did a while ago in order to find possibly chemically distant binders for cerebellum. This high throughput screen was based on the old FRET assay, which I mentioned before. And as there were always problems, especially with autofluorescence, it presumably also led to very many false positives hits in the high throughput screen, as we see here by these uh, colored compounds in the typical 384 well plate. Utilizing this custom MST-based assay, we are now cross-validating several hit clusters that were identified in the high-throughput screen.
which are shown here as single point MST measurements. And while we are still in the process of following up on several of these hits and hit clusters, I do want to share uh, some first very exciting news. And so here, for example, are the compounds BS1 to BS4, which already show high affinity to the bacterial homolog MSCI4 and also to the human thalidomide binding domain, shown on the bottom here as very nice binding curves. However, really surprisingly, this compound BS5 superseded all pre previously measured compounds, actually with such high affinities that the conversion from IC50 values to KI values no longer was possible. And so on this slide, I'm also showing just the IC50 values for the same reasons. So currently we are performing structure activity relationship studies shown here for this BS5 compound. The core binding moiety of BS5 is represented as this green blob. And with these few modifications shown here, we can, can already draw a lot of conclusions about how an ideal binding moiety should look like. For example, the terminal ring, which we see, is very favorable for affinities, as truncations, which you see on the, its direct left, um, led to lower IC50 values. The exact position of this ring, however, seems to be less fixed as shorter chain length, for example, does not influence or even help the affinities in some cases. And as mentioned before, since this uh, scaffold shows very high affinities, uh, we are investigating it, of course, as a potential building block for novel protects. As well as turning it into a molecular probe for our MST assay by coupling it to fluorophores. The next question, of course, which immediately arises is how do these compounds actually bind? And so we use X-ray crystallography to characterize their binding modes, mostly by using this bacterial homolog MSCR4, which is highly similar, so less than one angstrom RMSD over 100 C alpha atoms. And this is because this protein re uh, crystallizes reliably, and we can then exchange thalidomide, which was used to grow these crystals for our new compounds in question. Since there are some species-specific mutations, we are also constructing humanized versions of this bacterial protein, which we are currently establishing as a surrogate system for cerebron binding. We have used this to investigate many, many compounds, and also these novel hits um, that I mentioned are already characterized, but th at this point, apologies that I can't show them yet, so uh, please stay tuned for more news from our lab in this case here. So again, why are we actually interested in all of these novel moieties is that most Protex, the Protex design today, is um, based on thalidomide, as you see here. So the development of Protex is mostly combinatorial, and so we have shown, for example, this, that our midosuccinimide scaffold could serve as a universal binding mode. Moreover, we have now with these newly identified compounds, which superseded all previously investigated scaffolds in terms of affinity. Additionally, these new scaffolds also show a different exit vector. So the exit vector is the angle by which the protec, the parent protec, then leaves the binding pocket of cerebron. And these different angles actually have shown to alter the underlying properties of the protex in terms of not only potency, but also selectivity. And so we are excited to soon provide even more options for this combinatorial protect design. So coming back for the last few minutes, back to this E3 ligase overview slide. And from this picture, it becomes clear that there are way more E3 ligases than just these two, Cerebron and BHL. And if we take a look at how many of these E3 ligases have been utilized for protects until now, it is actually less than 2%. And so the next step, which we and other labs are also interested in, is characterizing more of these E3 ligases and making them usable for the PROTEC approach. This becomes especially interesting if we take a look at the fact that in contrast to Cerebron and VHL, which are ubiquitously expressed in almost all tissues um, throughout the body, there are tissue-specific and also tumor-specific E3 ligases. And so a big focus of the field right now is the characterization of novel E3 ligases. So here I want to show our general approach to do so, is starting out, of course, with the construct design of E3 receptors, especially interesting, as mentioned before, are disease-associated E3s. 
And then after cloning, expression, and purification, we usually start out with assaying them for their stability. As you can see here, for two of these substrate receptors, we obtain two stable proteins. One melts around 45 degrees Celsius, and the other one, which is a little bit more stable, at 55. Moreover, the left one shows a red shift in the nano DSF, whereas the right one shows a blue shift. And then following these stability assays, we aim to characterize them structurally and develop assays to screen for ligand binding. Here, of course, we hope to employ our general MST approach again by turning, for example, a natural substrate of the E3 ligase KLHTC2, which carries a dike lysin at the C terminus into a MST reporter molecule by coupling them to fluorophores. While it is, of course, also an option to use other affinities assays like fluorescence polarization, in principle, the development of MST assays requires less optimization because for fluorescence polarization, there are many more requirements for the fluorophore as half-life times are highly dependent on protein size and other factors and have to be optimized. In our case here, the idea of new E3 ligases is to use directed evolution methods like phage display to screen for high affinity peptides, as well as screening small molecule libraries for high affinity binders. All of this with the goal in mind to enable the usage of more E3 ligases for not only molecular glue, but also protec approaches. And so taken together, what I've shown you today for Cerebron is that we are performing structure activity relationship studies based on hit clusters from a high throughput screen. This is not only scientifically interesting to expand the chemical ligand space of Cerebron, but also, of course, for the design of novel protex. And for E3 ligases in general, I've just quickly shown you examples of how we want to characterize the uh, novel substrate receptors their binding modes and deck run recognitions while using directed evolution and small molecule libraries to obtain better binding motives. All of this with the goal in mind to expand the medical chemistry toolbox for protec design. This includes synthetic protex based on organic compounds, but also what's referred to as bioprotex, so engineered fusion proteins or peptides such as the diglycine motif, which I've shown for KLHDC2 which has recently been demonstrated um, as first examples to degrade GFP. So it is certainly a very exciting time to investigate novel binders for E3 ligases and enable more E3 ligases for this proximity-induced degradation approach. And we hope that with our data, we can aid in the development of not only substrate, but also tissue and cancer-specific proteins. And with this, I want to thank Nanotempo, of course, for inviting me to talk to you today. My uh, PI Marcus Hartmann for the project and guidance, our director Andre Lupas for the support and funding, and all the supporting scientists in the lab, especially Samuel Maywald, who has worked a lot on the uh, MST essay with me together. And then I want to thank our collaborators, the labs of Professor Janis, Professor Gutro, and Dr. Chris from the FMP in Berlin, as well as all the support staff from the SLS Beamline in Switzerland. And thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Chris, for that really interesting talk. So we do yeah. have time for questions now. So we, um, if, if you'd like to ask a question, do go to that Q&A box and please enter your question and we will ask Chris on your behalf. And if there are any questions that we don't get to today, then we will send you a response um, after the event. So we'll get straight into the questions, Chris. We have a few already. So um, a couple of related questions. How do you identify novel E3 ligases? And related to that, can novel E3 ligases be identified using known protax? That's a, a very interesting question. Um, yes, so um, the problem is uh, we are mostly working with already characterized E3 ligases at the moment. and. Um, search for alternative binders for them. Um, but of course, it's highly interesting in uh, finding new ones. Uh, one way to do this would be by similarity searches, so sequence similarity searches to find uh, homologs. Um, but I think the identification is very difficult. And, and um, I think there's enough work to do at the moment in characterizing these 600 uh, that I've shown you before. And uh, the second part of the question with, with Protex, uh, well, in general, these E3 ligases are highly substrate specific, right? So they uh, usually only recognize a, a specific chemical moiety. And so uh, two E3 ligases really should have to 
have the same substrate uh, specificity. So it, in theory, it's it's um, it is possible, but I think it's unlikely. Okay. Um, and do you have any comments on using long versus short linkers? Um, well, we, at at the moment, um, we, we're testing a few designs as, as everyone else, and um, I, I think there's no general guideline whether they have to be short or long, especially for um, I think for the for the BID degrading protex, there have been examples where packed linkers as short as four units have worked and had really high uh, degrading uh, constants. And the longest one, I think, were eight or nine units. So I don't think there's a there's a general um, rule to make up here. It's like I showed mm -hmm. in in the slide. It's it's mainly combinatorial at the moment, at least. And you spoke on disease-specific E3 ligases. Are they transient and not present when a patient is cured? Uh, so there, I can't say too much. So we're relying on literature there. So we, we don't do uh, in vivo studies on, on those at the moment. So I would have to uh, refer to literature here. Okay. And can this protech approach be used for antiviral drugs targeting RDRP of RNA viruses, specifically coronavirus? <laughs> yes, so I'm, I'm sure there's many pharmaceutical companies at the moment working on this. Um, so so we, we can't really compete with those pipelines. So our focus at the moment is really on these, um, on these alternative scaffolds, usually using uh, already established targets. So I'm, I'm sure it, it's, there's a lot of work being done on there, but uh, yes. It's not our main focus at the moment. Okay. The, how do you know the abundance of E3 ligase? So, uh, unfortunately, there's the same answer as for the, for the transient and disease specific, so we don't do the, uh, the characterization, but the, I've shown you this uh, Ubiqui hub. So there's a lot of information for everyone there. So you can, can check how the, how the abundance is in different diseases and uh, different tissues. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think there are some more here. Um, so did you test your E3 ligase ligands already as complete protax structures? Uh, we are doing that as, as we speak. So um, unfortunately, I can't show any data at the moment, but of course, that's yeah. the, the, the next question we're asking, right? So we really wanted to make sure that with the SAR study that I've shown you, that we find the, the best possible um, E3 binding motive to use for these protects. Okay, and maybe we'll have a couple more. Um, so do protects work if there are no lysines near the site where the targeting, targeting ligand binds to the target protein and is ubiquitination impaired? So, so there, there's the the, um, the topic of of lice in deserts. So, if you're you're targeted, you want to to degrade. Doesn't have any lysines on the on the surface. Um, it has been shown that I mean, you need a lysine to put the ubiquitin on. Um, so, so there's there's no way it gets uh, degraded then. Okay, thank you. And uh, our E3 ligases can also be explored as immunomodulators for vaccines, particularly therapeutic vaccine or prophylactic vaccines like mRNA and DNA based. So that's, there's a lot of um, hot discussions at the moment around this, of course, how the, how the application works and how to um, get this into the organism. So there's, there's a lot of things. So I have to refer again that we're mostly working on these, on these E3 binding parts at the moment. But I think it's, it has lots of um, progress being done, whether it's with uh, cell penetrating peptides that you can add or um, by using mRNA, for example. Yes. And regarding the linker, what do you think um, is PEG a better linker or alkyls are better? There, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. I have to refer to the to the last uh, protein degradation conference I went to, and there I, I think um, I don't recall who was it, but someone said that the these PEG linkers are are good for in vitro studies, but they are hor horrible in vivo. But um, I really have to quote here, so we don't um, don't work on this at the moment. Mm -hmm. And does your new number five CRBN alternative scaffold engage with known neo substrates? Um, that's a, of course, this, the thing um, we screen for. So it 
does look like these, be careful what I can say, um, so these, these typical sink finger substrates that usually get recruited by these emits don't seem to get recruited with our scaffold. That's what I can say. And I think related to that, is there anything specific about the CRBN protein that so many molecular glues or bifunctional degraders are being reported? Or is it just a matter of first-in-class phenomenon? It's, I think it's definitely first-in-class phenomenon. I mean, I, I've shown you that especially VHL and Cerebron just are ubiquitously expressed. And especially for Cerebron, these molecular glues, I mean, it was serendipitously, but the molecular glues, um, at least in this part, uh, thalidomide was described first there. So I think it is first in class. So we'll uh, definitely have to see which one um, comes out in the end. And um, also the, the Avinas compound, the most uh, advanced at the moment, also utilizes uh, Cerebron, as we've seen, uh, I think, two weeks ago. So. And we've still got a few questions coming. Um, so what happens to the molecular glue once target degradation has occurred? Does it remain, rem sorry, remain bound to the E3 ligase? Is it also degraded? So I have, we haven't done any pharmacological studies there, but it's um, from, from the, the literature, it does seem that, I mean, thalidomide um, has a lot of um, um, metabolites, and it also seems that some of these metabolites actually have a higher potency to um, exhibit these teratogenic effects. I um, refer here to this 5-hydroxythalidomide, uh, for example, of which a crystal structure was reported a while ago. Um, so there's definitely a, a turnover in the uh, metabolism. Okay, and we have time for one last question. So do molecular glues differ from protax in ligand screening? In ligand screening? Well, well, the thing is that for, for protex are highly specific, right? So you use this, this E3 binding moiety and, and your warhead and link them together. And with molecular glues, it's, there's no straightforward way to, to design them to degrade a specific substrate. So I, I would say for, especially for these molecular glues, it's, it's more, um, you, you can design, um, a small molecule, but then have to screen uh, proteo by a proteomics, for example, and see actually what gets degraded. And with Protex, there's a much more uh, directed approach to, to getting your, your uh, protein of interest degraded. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to leave it there for today for the question time, but if there's any questions that are unanswered, we will get back to you uh, with a response and we'll also mm -hmm. make sure we get a response from Chris um, if that's needed you as know, well. Sure. So I just want to th thank you, Chris, for your time today and for giving a really interesting talk. And thanks to all of our audience for tuning in. And I just want to remind you that if you'd like any more information, um, you know, about how Nanotemper can help with Protac research, um, then be sure to check out it was the green button, the link to the resources. So we have links to resources there, such as our Spotlight website on ProTac Research. Um, so be sure to check that out. And also don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you would like more information from us. So with that, I want to thank everyone and wish you a good afternoon or morning, wherever you are and rest of the day. So thanks, Chris, and thanks, everyone.